All right, so let's talk about surgical lasers. Surgical technologists need to understand a little bit of the physics behind lasers in order to understand why we choose certain lasers for certain procedures and not for other procedures. Okay, so lasers come in all different shapes and sizes, as you can see here. Different designs are designed to do different things. But in general, the general theory behind them, the general idea is the same. Just like the ESU, the electrosurgical unit that we use to use energy to cauterize and cut tissue, we're going to use lasers to do exactly the same thing. We're going to cut the tissue and we're going to cauterize or coagulate the tissue around it. Now the ESU uses electricity to heat up that tissue to the point where it vaporizes, that's what's cutting it, and then cauterizing that tissue nearby, which is sort of liquefying the proteins and then letting those proteins sort of solidify and seal off any blood vessels that might be there. And that helps prevent bleeding and oozing of different fluids throughout the wound that we're creating. So the ESU uses electricity and the electron is the basic component of electricity. Now with lasers, we use light. Light is that source of energy that we apply to the tissue to cause it to heat up. And the basic element of light is a photon. So with electricity, it's an electron. With light, it's a photon. So looking at the light bulb that I have shown here, I'm showing a bunch of different lines coming out of there, little squiggly lines. Each of those represents different waves coming out of that light bulb, different wavelengths. Notice some of them are real long waves, some of them are real short waves. That's because a regular incandescent light bulb puts out a lot of different wavelengths of light, which means a lot of different color of light. Each wavelength equals a very specific color. So the real long wavelengths that you see, those are red colors. The real short ones, those are going to be blue or violet, and the ones in between that might be yellow or green, something like that. Okay, so you have a bunch of different colors coming out of the same light bulb. And notice they're all going off in different directions. So regular light bulbs that we're used to using, the light just scatters in all different directions. Now lasers are different from this in two of those very important aspects. One, all the wavelengths of light, all the light that comes out of a laser is exactly the same color. In other words, all the wavelengths are exactly the same. In fact, they're in sync as they leave the laser. They're also leaving the laser all in exactly the same direction. They're not going all over the place. They're all going in exactly the same direction. So when we describe laser light, what we're talking about is light that is collimated and coherent. All right, now coherent is something you sort of understand. Coherent means everybody or everything is sort of working together. Think of like a marching band and everybody is in step as they're walking down the football field. All right, in that case, they are acting coherently. They're working together. Everybody's doing exactly the same thing. So coherent means all those waves are in sync. They're working together as those photons travel down the path of this laser light. Collimated means that they're all traveling in exactly the same path. They're going in exactly the same straight line. So they're parallel to each other. So collimated means parallel. Now, one of the ways that I used to remember this is the fact that collimated happens to actually have a couple of parallel lines in the word. So when you see collimated, think parallel. And you know what other word happens to have two parallel lines in it? Parallel. Perfect. So that's going to help you remember collimated means parallel. Coherent means everybody's doing the same thing in step. Okay, so that describes laser light. That's an important concept. So a laser itself is divided up into several components. So down here at this end of the laser is called the laser head. This is where the laser light is coming out of the laser. It's being focused. It's directed at a specific point. It's pointing at the tissue that we're trying to either cut or cauterize. So the laser head is where the light comes out. Then you have the conduction area where the laser light travels through. And sometimes this is a rigid tube and the laser hits some, some mirrors and bounces around. And sometimes in some lasers, it's actually fiber optic. So the laser light sort of flows through the fiber optic cable. Back at the back of the end of the laser, this is called the energy pump. This is where the laser light is actually generated. 
So the way we get light out of a laser is we take some stuff and we put it in the energy pump part of the laser and we run a current through there. Or we do something to get it all excited and moving and shaking around. And when we do this, this stuff emits light. It sends off photons. But because it's all one kind of stuff, it's always going to emit exactly the same wavelength, exactly the same color photons as all the other stuff that's in there because it's all the same stuff. All right, now take a look at this picture. This picture, it, I don't know if you can see it, but it says that this is a CO2 laser. So what do you think the stuff that we put inside this energy pump is to get it excited and send out the light? Well, the stuff is CO2. It's carbon dioxide. So this is a carbon dioxide laser, and it's named that because uh, that's the stuff that we put in it, and we excite it, and it sends out the light. Okay? So we know that a laser that's called a CO2 laser uses CO2 as the stuff that we get excited, and it sends out the light. So here's a tricky question. What do you think we put inside a krypton laser? Well, that's going to be krypton. That's the chemical element that we put in there and excite it and it sends out the light. So what do you think we put inside of an argon laser? I think you're getting good at this. Argon. Exactly right. Got another one for you. You ready? What do we put inside of an nd YAG laser? Well, this is easy, right? Neodymium, yttrium, aluminum, and garnet crystals. You got that, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you didn't quite get that one, maybe you ought to write it down because that might be important. So whether or not you've actually heard of these names of different materials or not, the lasers are usually named after whatever material is going to go in them in order to create that light. So why do we have different stuff that goes inside of lasers? Can't we just use one laser and have it be the same stuff and it always works the same way? Well, the reason we have different stuff in different lasers is because different stuff creates different colors of light. All right, the CO2 laser creates one color. The Krypton laser creates a different color. The Argon, a different color. The nd -YAG laser, a different color. And those colors are important for what we're going to do, what we're going to use that laser for. So yeah, lasers come in all different colors. Usually we think of red as laser light, but really, depending on the stuff that you put in it, you can get all manner of colors out of these lasers. Here we have reds and greens and blues and violets, and there are even lasers that send out colors that are outside of the visible spectrum. So when I talk about the visible spectrum, I'm talking about the amount of light that we can see. We can see certain colors of light, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right? Okay, those are the colors we can see. But there's colors outside of this visible spectrum. It's still light, but we can't see it. Our eyes aren't adapted to see these colors. So there's infrared light, light waves that are long enough that we can't see them. On the other end, there's ultraviolet light, light waves that are real short and we can't see it. But we know that's still there, right? Because if we go out in the sun, it gives us a nice sunburn if we don't put on our sunscreen, or it can even give us skin cancer. So ultraviolet light, infrared light, they exist, we just can't see it. And certain lasers emit those colors of light, even if we can't see those colors. So why is color so important? Well, it has to do with the way light interacts with different materials. So here's an example. A couple of different ways that light can interact with material. We have reflection. The light can bounce off the material. Think of a mirror. Okay, the light comes in, bounces off the material, and goes off in a different direction. We have absorption, where the light comes in and is just sucked in by that material and it stays there. It doesn't, the energy from that light stays in that material. Or the light can be transmitted. It passes straight through that material like it's not even there. Okay, those are the three different interactions that light can have with material. Now, the one that's most important to us, the one that we care about the most when we're talking about trying to heat up some tissue to make it really, really hot so it either vaporizes or at least cauterizes, is we care about absorption. So when a material absorbs a certain color of light, it's going to get real hot and either vaporize or cauterize, and that's our goal. So we're looking for light that's going to uh, be absorbed by certain tissues. Now, there's one thing about this image here that I don't really like. 
Like here, on this material, it's showing the purple light, the green light, and the yellow light are all reflecting off of this material. And in this case, the purple, green, and yellow are all being absorbed. And in this case, the purple, green, and yellow are all being transmitted. But that's not the real world. The real world doesn't work that way. How do we know? Well, take a look at my shirt. It's a blue shirt. Why is it blue? Because my shirt is reflecting blue light and it's absorbing or transmitting all the other colors. So you're seeing a blue shirt because my shirt has certain chemicals in it that reflect blue light. And different chemicals and different substances react differently to different colors of light. So this image should really look like this. And here you can see substance A is transmitting yellow light. It's, being, it's absorbing green light and it's reflecting purple light. But substance B over here is absorbing yellow light, reflecting green light and transmitting purple. And substance C over here is doing something different still. So different materials react to different light differently. That's really important to understand that concept, to understand why we use the lasers that we do. And you've seen this. Again, my shirt is blue because it's reflecting blue light and absorbing all the others. If I had a red shirt on, that's because the red shirt has chemicals that reflect red light and absorb all the others. So you know that mater different materials react differently to different colors of light. But you also see it out there in the real world as well, not just with dyes and inks, okay? So take a look at this. Here we have a swimming pool. Swimming pool looks nice and blue, nice and inviting, right? But why is it blue? I mean, the bottom is painted white, so why do we see blue? Well, the reason we see blue is because water is really good at transmitting blue light. The blue light comes in from the sun, bounces off the bottom, comes right back up to us. We can see that blue light. It actually absorbs a little bit of the red light. So the light that we see is blue because water transmits blue light really, really well. Here's another example. You know anybody who goes outside in the middle of winter to try to get a suntan? Because they really like that dark glow that the suntan gives them. So they're laying out in the sun for a little bit. But because it's winter, it's really cold. And they realize, wow, this is really stupid. I'm going to go back inside. They find a nice big window. And they sit in front of the window. And they lay there in this nice big bright sunbeam. And they try to get a suntan. Well, what happens? Do you know? Nothing or at least very little, they don't get a suntan, not through a window. Why? Because glass, although glass is perfectly transparent to visible light, to all the colors that we see, it is not transparent to ultraviolet light. And it's ultraviolet light that gives us the nice suntan that we're looking for. So glass blocks most of the ultraviolet light. Yeah, a little bit seeps through, but most of that ultraviolet light that you get when you're laying out on the beach doesn't come through a piece of glass. So it's really hard to get a nice suntan in the middle of winter, and that's why. All right, so here's another example. Look at my hand. Can you see what color pen I'm holding behind my hand? You can't? Why not? Because you can't see through my hand, right? Okay, yep, there it is, it's a red pen. But if I put my hand here, you can't see it. Why? Because light doesn't travel through my hand, right? I have light skin, so the light reflects off of it, but it doesn't transmit through. If I had darker skin, it would be absorbed by my skin, but it doesn't transmit through. So light doesn't transmit through your hand, except when it does. Here's an example of light x-rays which are a color of light, a color of light that we can't see, x-rays transmit through your hand just fine, especially the fleshy parts of your hand. Now, not so much through the bone, which is why the bone sort of stands out in an x-ray, which is kind of cool. So bones sort of absorb that x-rays, but the fleshy part, the light passes straight through almost like it's not even there, almost like it's a window. So different colors of light interact with different materials differently. Something that might be transparent in one color would be completely opaque, completely, completely blocked in a different color. You okay with that concept? That's really important to understand lasers in surgery. So let's take a look at some eye surgery, for example. Let's say we have a patient that comes in and they have a little bit of a bleed in the back of their eye, on the retina of their eye. Their blood vessels are bleeding just a little bit. They're kind of oozing a little bit back there. 
And what's happening is that blood's sort of spreading out and destroying the tissue and covering the tissue, and they're having trouble seeing in those areas. So we want to put a stop to that. We don't want that bleeding to continue so, until they lose all of their vision. We want to stop the bleeding. Well, how do we normally stop the bleeding? Well, we come in with a cautery, a ESU, and we sort of buzz it. So in order to get to the retina, we're going to make an incision into the eye, take the ESU and buzz it, right? No, that's probably not a good idea because we're going to end up doing more damage to the eye than we are going to be helping it by stopping that little bit of bleed. But we can use lasers to do exactly what we want. Watch this. Here, we have a laser beam coming in through the cornea of the eye, which is nice and clear. We can see through it. It goes through the aqueous humor in the front of the eye. It goes through the pupil because there's nothing there. It goes through the lens, still nice and clear. It goes through the vitreous humor in the back of the eye. And it goes through all of these without interacting with it. And then finally it gets to the back of the eye, the retina. And that's where the laser beam interacts with the material that we're trying to target. In this case, blood. All right, so we're going to target the blood. We want to heat that blood up real hot, get it to melt away some of the proteins around those blood vessels, liquefy it a little bit, and then when it coagulates, it seals off those blood vessels, stopping the bleeding. So in this case, we're using a laser to go through some material and target a specific kind of material. In this case, we're targeting blood vessels, and we want to coagulate them. And we can do this without having to cut through all these other layers of the eye. That's pretty cool. Now, if you remember from just a slide ago, there's actually a problem with this image. In this image, the artist used a nice red line to indicate the laser beam. And that's because everybody associates laser beams with red lines, right? Except in this case, we're talking about an argon laser. And an argon laser is actually blue. Now, if you think about it, it makes sense. Because remember, water transmits blue light. And what's the cornea made up of? A lot of water. The aqueous humor is almost all water. The lens is a lot of water. The vitreous humor is a lot of water. And then finally you get back to the blood. Now you get hemoglobin and all this other stuff in there. Okay, so blue light transmits through all those layers of the eye until it hits the blood and then it's absorbed by the blood. So an argon laser, which is used to cure retinal bleeding, is a blue laser. So let's take a look at some of the other lasers and where they fall on the spectrum of light. Now you see here in the middle, we have our visible spectrum. These are the colors that we actually see. Again, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. But outside of that visible light area, we have ultraviolet to one side, and we have infrared light down to the other. And you can see some of the lasers are outside of that visible spectrum. So let's start all the way down at the end. We have the CO2 laser. Now you notice there's a little break here. And that's because the CO2 laser is actually so far down the spectrum that it wouldn't have fit on this page if I had drawn it any other way. So far, in fact, that it's practically microwaves. And you're familiar with microwaves. You're familiar with your microwave oven. What happens when you take your cup of water and you put it in the microwave and you turn it on for a few minutes? What happens? The water gets hot. And that's because it's absorbing the microwaves coming from your microwave oven and it's heating it up. Now the water gets really hot. How about what happens if you grab the handle of the cup? Well, it depends on the material, but sometimes that handle is going to get hot as well. But that's because microwaves really heat up water really well, and usually a lot of other stuff as well. So pretty much anything that you're trying to heat up, a microwave is going to be a good way to do it. So down in the, the distant infrared, down towards the microwave range, these are wavelengths of light. These are colors of light that are absorbed very easily by water. But right around 2,000 or so nanometers, all of a sudden the absorption by water drops off dramatically. Colors above 2,000 nanometers, those col that light is not going to be absorbed by the water very much at all. In fact, it's going to pass through the water. So there's a change that happens there. So in the rest of the red range, red light, near red, tends to be absorbed really well by dark tissues and minerals. 
So the lasers you see in that range tend to be used on dark tissues and minerals. How about the visible spectrum? Right in the heart of the visible spectrum, and you think about this one, it'll make sense. Dyes and pigments. Because this is the visible spectrum. This is the part of the light that we actually see. This is all the different colors that we see. So we know that we use dyes and pigments, like on my shirt, to create different colors because of the way they absorb and reflect different colors of light. So colors in the visible spectrum are absorbed really well by dyes and pigments. A little bit above that, we have blue light and blood and melanin, the stuff in your skin that makes it nice and dark. The melanin and the blood tend to absorb a whole lot of blue light. Blue light really targets those things. And then finally at the end, we're into ultraviolet light. Now, if you think about this one, it makes sense as well. Because if we spend too much time in the sun, what happens? Well, we get a sunburn or we get skin cancer. Now, what, why do we get skin cancer? Because ultraviolet light is coming in, it's being absorbed by our DNA so much that the DNA heats up, it sort of shatters, and it creates some mutations in the DNA which cause cancer. Sunburn is caused when the skin cells absorb that ultraviolet light. They get real hot and you get a sunburn. So ultraviolet light is absorbed really well by amino acids. Now amino acids make up your DNA and amino acids also make up protein. Now protein is amino acids plus a little chain of extra stuff, but amino acids are a large building block of protein. So if we're using ultraviolet light, we're targeting protein. So there's the different kinds of materials that we can target using different color laser light. So knowing this, let's see if we can figure out what procedures might use which lasers because of the colors that those lasers produce. So the first example, let's say we have a kidney stone. We want to send a little probe in all the way up to the kidney, find that kidney stone, and we want to zap it with some laser light to cause it to heat up so it shatters into little pieces, and then those little pieces can flow out of the body. All right, so that's our goal. We're targeting that kidney stone. Which laser color or which range do you think we're going to choose to target that kidney stone? Well, a kidney stone's made up of minerals, lots of different minerals, so probably something in this area. And in fact, an ND YAG laser is a good choice for shattering kidney stones. That's what many doctors use to treat kidney stones. All right, so here's another example. Let's take a look at this one up here. We haven't mentioned this one yet, a KTP laser. Now again, lasers are usually named by the stuff that's inside of them. So in this case, we have potassium, and potassium is represented by the letter K on the periodic table. This is a big important one. You have to remember this in other places as well. Potassium is important to the body. Potassium is represented by the letter K. So K is for potassium, titanium, and phosphorus. So a KTP laser is potassium, titanium, and phosphorus. And it emits a real pretty green light. Now here's green right here in the middle of the visible spectrum. What's it most absorbed by? Dyes and pigments. Okay. So what procedures do you think a KTP laser might be used on? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to heat up dyes and pigments to the point where they break up. But hopefully we don't heat up the cells around it. We're just trying to heat up the dyes and pigments. So if we have some dyes or pigments that's in our skin that we've artificially injected into our skin and we want to get rid of that, we're going to use a KTP laser to target those dyes and pigments and break them up. And in fact, that's exactly what tattoo removal is all about, using a KTP laser to heat up those dyes and pigments to the point where they break up and they go away. Okay, we already talked about the blue laser, the argon laser, which is absorbed really well by blood. So sealing blood vessels and argon laser, especially in the retina, is really good for that. So here's one more, and this, one, this one's a little bit tougher. We're gonna to think through it, okay? So let's say, instead of trying to target the retina of the eye, instead of trying to target the back of the eye, let's say we wanna target the cornea, the very front of the eye. Let's say we wanna reshape that cornea a little bit so that we can bend the light in a different direction so that I can see better and I no longer have to wear glasses. 
Well, that sounds kind of cool, and we can do that, and we can do that with lasers. But we need a laser, not one that's going to get all the way back to my retina, but one that's going to stay here on the cornea of my eye. So what lasers might be good for that? Well, let's go through the list. Let's see. We've got dark tissues and minerals. Are there any dark tissues or minerals in the cornea of my eye? No, not really, because it's perfectly clear. All right. How about dyes or pigments? No, not really. How about blood or melanin? No, none of that either. Now, the cornea is made up of cells, perfectly transparent cells, but there's no blood feeding them. It actually gets its nutrients other ways through the aqueous humor and such. Okay, so there's no blood there to target. So this middle range here, that's probably out. None of these are going to be absorbed real well by my cornea. So what's left? Well, we've got protein and water. And if you think about it, what's a cornea made up of? It's made up of protein and water. It's probably about 50-50 each or thereabouts, okay? It's kind of like jello or a jellyfish, all right? What's the difference between a jello and a jellyfish? Well, pretty much the taste. That's about it. Otherwise, it's the same stuff. What's the difference between a jellyfish and your cornea of your eye? Well, pretty much the same exact kind of stuff. It's protein and water mixed together. So lasers at either end of the spectrum here are probably going to target that cornea really well. So one of the things that you're going to discover as you continue through this surgical technology program is that a lot of the questions that you're going to be asked, both on tests in class and on the national boards, they're not necessarily looking for the right answer versus the wrong answer, okay? They're looking for the best answer. So sometimes you're going to have two or three or maybe all of the answers are pretty good, but what we're looking for is the best best answer. What answer really covers it well? So in this case, we're targeting the cornea of the eye and the cornea is made up of water and protein. So which laser is going to be the best to use in this situation? Well, the way I think of it is this. You can target the water in the cornea and that's going to work. But what's immediately behind the cornea of the eye? Well, immediately behind the cornea, you have the aqueous humor in the front of the eye, okay? And that is like 99% water, and there's a little bit of protein in there, but not a whole lot. So there's a whole lot of water in that aqueous humor. So if we get any leakage of that laser, if the laser happens to miss the cornea and goes through a little bit further, it's going to go into the aqueous humor. It's going to be absorbed by the aqueous humor. It's going to boil off the aqueous humor. That's probably not what we want to have happen. So what we want to do is we want to target the cornea, but not the aqueous humor immediately behind it. So we want to use a laser that targets protein because the cornea has a lot of protein and the aqueous humor has almost none. So the best answer is going to be a laser that targets the protein in that cornea. And what laser does that? An eczema laser. And in fact, what you find is if you're going in for radial keratotomy or the newer version, LASIK surgery, which corrects your vision, which reshapes the cornea of the eye so that you can see more clearly, they use an eczema laser to do that. They're targeting the protein in the cornea of the eye. Does that make sense? So different lasers give different colors, and it's important because different colors react with different materials differently. We have to figure out what it is we're trying to target with those colors and choose the right laser appropriately for that color. Whenever you're using lasers in any sort of surgical procedure or really anywhere else, you want to wear eye protection because as we just talked about, some lasers can get all the way back to the retina and cause retinal damage, whereas other lasers can cause damage to your cornea. So either way, no matter what laser you're using, there's the possibility for some eye damage if that laser beam is reflected the wrong way and hits your eye. So wear eye protection and different color eye protections are going to protect you from different laser colors, but wear the eye protection that's appropriate for the laser that you happen to be using that day. One other difference between different colors and different lasers is how deeply they penetrate different materials. As you can see on both ends, you have the CO2 laser, maybe the KTP laser. They don't get very deep into the tissue. But look at the ND AG laser right there in the middle. It gets real deep. It makes a nice deep cut into that material. 
So let's say, for example, we have a bladder tumor. All right. And what we want to do is we want to cut around that bladder tumor. We want to cut it out nice and deep around it. What's a good laser to choose? Yeah, probably the ND YAG laser because it makes a nice deep cut. It gets all that tissue out of there. We want to get all that cancer cells out of there, burn them off and cut them out so that the depth that the laser goes into the tissue is also an important factor in choosing which laser we use. So because the CO2 laser, practically a microwave oven, which is what it is, heats up pretty much anything you target with it, the CO2 laser really is the most commonly used laser that you're going to see in surgical procedures because it's going to work on a whole lot of stuff. But it goes very, very shallow. But the ND YAG laser, because it cuts so deeply, it does have a nice wide range of different uses in the OR. So in your book, ST for ST, there are several pages devoted to all the different lasers that we use in surgery. There's lots of detail, lots of information in there, and it's good information. But if you're looking for just a summary of that information, try to organize it into something that makes a little bit of sense. I've created a chart for you, which you see here. And you can download a copy of this chart by using the links below this video. I hope you find this video helpful, and good luck on your national boards.